Okay, uh, greetings everyone. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Jindal School of International Affairs of OP Jindal Global University, uh, I want to welcome you uh, to this webinar uh, panel discussion on threats to international peace and security. Um, OP Jindal Global University, um, where Jindal School of International Affairs is located, uh, is in um, the national capital region of Delhi and uh, is uh, one of the most reputed private institutions of the country. And we have been um, associated with the premier online learning educational platform, Coursera, uh, for almost uh, two years now. And uh, our flagship degree program in the field of international relations is available to all of you. It's uh, the master's degree MA in international relations, security and strategy. And um, we are admitting students for the spring semester, for the spring cohort, uh, which be, the spring semester begins March 1st, which is uh, very soon. And uh, we uh, would strongly encourage all of you who are interested to learn uh, from our learned uh, you know, professors and to acquire knowledge and in-depth understanding of uh, international uh, security issues to think about joining our <laughs> master's degree. Um, so the point is, uh, we are uh, gathering here um, in order to talk about an issue that's uh, always of paramount importance in world affairs. Forever there have been threats uh, to international peace and security, uh, but we are obviously going to focus on the contemporary threats. And uh, for that, I wanted to um, begin by talking about uh, flashpoints. As you know, uh, there are different regions and sub-regions of the world, and many of you come from different regions, I encourage you to please, in the chat box, uh, post the countries from which you are all uh, logging in so that we have a better sense of the geographies that have been covered. And you can also post questions in the Q&A uh, section while we are talking. So um, different regions and sub-regions of the world, uh, all of them with their own peculiar security dynamics, but many of which are in flames many of which are uh, in dire crisis and many of which are facing either active or slow burning uh, armed conflicts of one form or the other. And uh, also in some, in some regions of the world, a buildup that could eventually break out into more wars. Uh, we are in a definitely a darker era than even I would say five years ago. And uh, things have worsened and the chances of um, you know, a, a conflict between two countries or in a wider region or even internally within a country flaring up and becoming bigger and engulfing um, the whole world are uh, quite high in the current era where uh, the so-called unipolar era of US liberal, uh, US dominated liberal world order has become significantly weaker. Uh, and there are many challengers uh, to this liberal order, revisionist states, but also many non-state uh, actors and groups that wish to uh, remake their respective regions, uh, if not the whole world. So we are living in dangerous times. And that's the opening remark I'd like to uh, place before you. And it is for all of us collectively, those of us who are interested in international security to wonder what went wrong and how can we fix it? And if at all, there's something that we can do uh, as students and scholars to try and prevent the slide that could be worse and worse. Uh, I'm reminded always of Pope Francis, um, one of my favorite international um, leaders who recently said that um, we are already in World War III. And uh, it's just that um, it looks like we are far away from conflict zones, which are multiplying, but then because of the effects of interdependence and globalization, all of us are drawn into it one way or the other. And to think that we can be um, ourselves uh, cocooned from uh, or, or uh, walled off from the uh, this widening spiral of conflicts is going to be a mistake, he says. And he says it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's his own way of reminding us that there are many, many, many threats emerging. And we, if we don't address them or if we just ignore them, uh, then they will come to possibly haunt us. So, uh, of course, our the technical definition of a world war is far from uh, what we are today. But then um, there are there are buildups, as I said. So let's focus on some of these flashpoints in the discussion. We have a very eminent panel with us, 
And um, I, uh, you, you know the bios of each and every panelist, and I'm not going to introduce them, but I'll uh, invite my colleagues, my uh, esteemed colleagues, scholars and scholar practitioners from the Jindal School of International Affairs to come in and share their views uh, on these flashpoints. I'm going to start with the biggest flashpoint of all, which is, of course, the uh, war in Eastern Europe that uh, instead of dying down and uh, instead of uh, going into a freeze, has actually become hotter as we reach the first anniversary. 24th February is the first anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war. And it continues to dominate the international um, security landscape as the number one challenge because of its multiple ramifications, because big powers are involved and because of the many negative externalities. So let me bring in, to begin with my colleague, uh, Ambassador Mohan Kumar, he was uh, distinguished um, former ambassador of India to France and uh, Bahrain, and uh, he um, is um, focus, he's a specialist on European security issues. And I want to bring him in first uh, and ask uh, Ambassador Mohan Kumar what he thinks is likely to happen with this flashpoint, where even the usage of nuclear weapons have been threatened, and the um, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Some of you may have heard the news you know, they maintain the doomsday clock, have turned the um, the minutes uh, arrow uh, closer to midnight, which means closer to total apocalypse or, dooms or doomsday. And they believe that the likelihood of even nuclear war cannot be ruled out the way things are escalating here. So uh, to begin with Ambassador Mohan Kumar, Europe of all the places which were considered to have sorted out their security problems after World War II and relatively... Uh, at peace, uh, of all the places in the world, the worst war or the biggest war uh, uh, has happened there. Uh, so your thoughts on threats to international peace and security uh, going into the future, starting with Europe. Thank you very much, Sriram. And it's a great honor and pleasure to participate in this uh, panel with all my colleagues as well. I want to begin by saying in all the 36 to 40 years that I have been a student myself, of international affairs. There has been no other time in my personal view when you can say the world is going through what has been called a poly crisis. That is to say there is not just a political or a security crisis, but there is an economic crisis, there is a social crisis, there is an identity crisis. So that's point number one. Point number two, I think we've seen a complete breakdown of multilateral institutions, beginning with the UN Security Council. If you cannot put an end to the war in the heart of Europe, I suggest to you somewhat irreverently that the UN Security Council should dissolve itself to begin with, frankly. I mean, there is no business to exist. As you rightly said, Sri Ram, we didn't expect a war in Europe. Coming to the Russian uh, uh, intervention in Ukraine, I think we should call the Russian intervention for what it is. I think it's an invasion. I don't think we should take uh, shelter behind special military operation and intervention. This is invasion, pure and simple, whichever way you look at it. Number two, and that is what complicates this issue. Number two, anybody who tells me this is unprovoked aggression is completely wrong. Russia has been provoked plenty by the West. If you, if you just care to go back in time, you will see that Russia has been poked by NATO all along. But that doesn't justify what Putin did, what Russia did, because it is a violation of the UN uh, law issue, the UN Charter, the territorial integrity and sovereignty. And there are international agreements signed between Russia and Ukraine, going back to the Budapest Agreement, if you want, you can Google it, take a look at it, which actually, for example, Ukraine was to give up their nuclear weapons. In return, its territorial integrity was to be protected. That was one of the key agreements signed by Ukraine. So whichever way you look at it, I think Russian invasion is condemnable and unjustifiable. Now, in terms of prognosis, I think this is going according to what a lot of people predicted, which is that it is going to be a war of attrition. The longer it lasts, I'm afraid it is Russia which will have the upper hand because in terms of sheer numbers and resources, they are a much bigger country. But the West has doubled down on Ukraine. 
So, Sri Ram, as you rightly mentioned, my fear is that a proxy war is about to become a real NATO-Russia war. It is not yet a NATO-Russia war. It's a proxy war. But if you go down the route of Abrams tanks and Leopard tanks, and then you choose to give them F-16 aircraft, you choose to give them the, um, the long-term missiles that now Ukraine seems to be asking, then I think you are seeing the transition from a proxy war to a, to a real war between NATO and Russia. So where does that leave countries like India? For no fault of India and of several developing countries, there are important ramifications of the war in Ukraine, which is affecting us, beginning with um, disruption of supply chains, fertilizer availability, sunflower oil availability, food grain availability, not so much for India, but for Africa. There is energy security, which is at stake. We are now buying Russian oil. I don't know how long we will be able to buy it. For, for India, the existential issue is also, what kind of Russia are you going to be left with at the end of the war? After all, 70 to 80% of our military platforms are Russian, whether we like it or not, as of today, especially the Army and the, and the Air Force, much less for Navy, but the Army and the Air Force, it is 70 to 80% military platforms are from Russia. So what do we do and what should the strategy be? I think as India takes on the G20 presidency, there have been lone voices here and there saying that India should take it upon itself to mediate between Russia and Ukraine. I personally think it is a tall order. Not sure we have the agency to do it, but I think it's worth trying. Certainly, uh, China's and India's message to Russia that a nuclear war would be unacceptable seems to have been heard for the time being by Putin. That's the impression I have. But we are looking more and more at the unpredictability of the leader in Russia. But to be fair, I would also say them in March 2022, if students care to go through, there was a proposal put forward for a resolution of this issue, frankly, to declare Ukraine's sovereignty, I mean, neutrality. There was, there was a broad outline of a problem. My understanding is that the West vetoed it. And um, that is why um, Ukraine went back on that proposal. And then, of course, we know what has happened since then. 100,000 people have definitely died on either side. And I put it to you that 100,000 for Russia is a small number, but 100,000 for Ukraine is a very big number. To blandly uh, follow the Western media and say that Russia is losing the war would be a mistake in my personal view, because whatever it is, Russia is sitting on 20% of Ukraine's territory, and that cannot be wished away. So what is it that both sides hope to gain? I think in terms of uh, Russia, I think the Crimea would be non-negotiable. Crimea would be non-negotiable for Russia, but Donbass may be a subject of negotiations. As far as Ukraine is concerned, their position seems to be that they must get back every inch of the territory, including Crimea. I am simply unable to understand, Sriram, how uh, Ukraine can do that. So in the middle of all this, how do you have... Uh, um, you know, any kind of talk between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, for me, the only way out is perhaps a combination of Indonesia, India, Brazil. These are the three troika of G20. Indonesia was the previous president. India is the current president. We're going to hand over the baton to Brazil. This may not be as outlandish as it sounds. I think there could be something in it uh, I believe that the Western powers have forfeited their right to, to intervene, including Turkey, because France certainly could have done this, but now it's, I don't think it's in a position to mediate. So I think combination of India, Indonesia, Brazil may just work, but I think we should keep that the, there is, I'm going to conclude because I know a lot of speakers and we have a, a record number of participants, Sriram, my, 
My request to you is perhaps we should allow them to ask questions. I never thought 150 people will attend, but I just want people to go through the RAND report, which is interesting. Everybody knows RAND Corporation. It is a military oriented organization funded by the United States government. The RAND report is calling for a negotiated end to this conflict, point number one. Point number two, the US General Chief of Staff, Milley, is also asking for a negotiated end to this conflict. There are enough people outside the government in the United States who strongly believe that the more the war drags on, it is not in the interest of the United States. So I will conclude here, Shiram, but happy to really interact with this record audience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ambassador Mohan Kumar. So on one hand, there's a breakdown of the formal institutions like the UN and all, which seem totally paralyzed, at least uh, on the question of bringing the war to an end or uh, even ushering in a ceasefire, although they are doing smaller level uh, arrangements for food grain shipments and uh, prisoner exchange and humanitarian aid and such things. Uh, but on the other hand, Ambassador Mohan Kumar, still believes that uh, formal uh, the, the new institutions like G20, uh, which is now led by India this year, uh, could potentially play a role in brokering uh, some kind of a thaw, if not a complete halt to this war. So uh, let's keep an eye on Europe, and I'm sure it will again uh, re-emerge while we go to the other flashpoints. Now let me move on to East Asia. Now East Asia is another powder keg. There's no doubt that uh, some of the most, um, you know, high tension, high wire acts of confrontation and clash and tension uh, uh, and 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 uh, competition uh, exist in East Asia. There are a couple of uh, issues there. One uh, or three, I would say. One is the whole um, focus around North Korea and its missile and nuclear programs. North Korea is on the verge of testing its seventh nuclear device. It can happen anytime. Uh, and the repercussions of that will be huge for the region. Two is the uh, tensions over Taiwan that continue to build up between China and the United States and the US alliance system. Uh, there's a likely uh, visit of the Republican um, uh, House majority uh, leader uh, to Taiwan, and that could be even more explosive than what we saw when the Democrat uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, visited Taiwan last year in 2022. So, uh, and with all these spy balloon incidents and so on, uh, you can expect uh, great power rivalry to hot up. Uh, and there's also the Philippines, uh, which uh, has drawn closer to the, to the US in the security sphere, and which is now facing increased uh, uh, challenge from China that wants to revise the order completely in its favor and to essentially create a Sinocentric uh, Asia uh, as, uh, as a pathway for it to become the number one in the world and to displace the United States. And then there is, uh, assigned, along with it is the question of uh, the South China Sea disputes, which uh, from time to time do flare up and you cannot rule out an incident that could get bigger and draw in all the regional powers. Uh, there is something going on uh, deeper in the region. Uh, both Australia and Japan have increased their defense expenditures and are trying to form endogenous coalition, whether or, I mean, some of which involve the US, but some of which only involve local regional actors, all with an eye to counterbalance China. And the Chinese are very upset about Japan's increasing posture on defense and also Australia's. So there's likely um, lots of tensions in this region. Let me bring in my colleagues. Professor uh, Sriparna Padak and Ambassador uh, J.N. Mishra. Uh, both of them teach courses on East Asia, Northeast Asia, and Southeast Asia. So let me begin with Professor Sriparna Padak and ask her uh, what she thinks are the reasons for this increased threats to international peace and security in East Asia. And what can we do? Thank you, Professor Cholia. Uh, a lot of things happening in East Asia, but one point remains, which is China. Around all of these, uh, we are having an audio issue, uh, Professor Pata. Could you just check okay. your audio? Uh, let me, and while you do that, let me bring in uh, Ambassador Mishra first, um, while you fix your audio, please. Uh, Ambassador Mishra, 
um, increased heightened threats over South China Sea dispute and uh, likelihood of great power uh, tensions spilling over and uh, incidents that may happen that could uh, spiral out of control? Yes, thank you very much, Dean. Incidents have happened in the past, but uh, all of them so far have not led to wider conflagrations because uh, there is collectively within ASEAN and um, Southeast Asia more generally, uh, as well as individually, there is not stomach to take on the fight against China, except to some extent Vietnam, even that is extremely calibrated and restrained in its response because of the pragmatic need to safeguard a very important relationship and the dependencies on trade and other things. Uh, the Philippines has uh, uh, given basing rights to the United States. I don't know how much that means, uh, how much significance it will hold in the near and the medium term. As far as the others are concerned, uh, the Yusuf Ishak Institute report has just come out on Southeast Asia and it's very interesting. China is undoubtedly the most consequential power and at the same time, the least like power. So what is ASEAN going to do about it? It's very noteworthy that ASEAN is always trumpeting its centrality in the region, but the people of the ASEAN are very disappointed according to the 2023 survey in ASEAN's uh, focus and lack of focus in uh, maintaining and safeguarding a regional security architecture that takes into account Chinese aggressive behavior. So the ASEAN has failed according to its own people. So the governments uh, collectively and individually parrot the same old line. We believe in ASEAN centrality. We do it, everybody does it for diplomatic niceties. But in the real world of power, I think multilateralism has limited value. When we say the United Nations has failed, the United Nations has always failed, relatively. It's very rarely succeeded in anything. Uh, so it's all about real politic. It's all about a chaotic power-based Westphalian world and Southeast Asia is no exception. But China has changed the facts on the ground through its gray zone tactics. That's very important. And there's been no blowback. There's been no kind of pushback against China in the military domain of physical pushback and no country has been able to do it. And ASEAN itself is divided. We know uh, Cambodia, Laos uh, on one side, for example, and Vietnam and the Philippines on the other. But Vietnam is a, a kind of an outlier because it has its historical problems with China. It's the only country, regional power, that has some ability to stand up to China as their uh, white paper, defense white paper 2019 says we need and we should go for multilateral security partnerships for the first time ever, but they do not name China because China is their number one trading part, 20% plus of Vietnamese trade with China, one fifth of its trade. So that's the kind of dependency what we are talking about. India's cumulative investment is uh, $26 billion odd. And that's uh, less than what China invests uh, in the month of October 2020, for example. So what are we talking about? The interesting thing from India's point of view, lastly, is according to this report is that there is greater confidence uh, in India's ability to shape a regional security architecture and greater trust in India's ability to play uh, some kind of a role in the region, not a global role, but at least a regional role and its capacity. Now that uh, is very interesting because uh, that was not the case, except Cambodia, most of the other countries have shown greater confidence in India this year. That's partly because of India's stand on the Ukraine war. I won't go into that, but I will say no conflagration, no firefight, but low level simmering disputes and occasional uh, uh, clashes will happen. Thank you, Ambassador Mistra. Uh, Ambassador Jain Mistra was India's ambassador to Portugal and Laos, and uh, he knows uh, Southeast Asia very well. He teaches courses in you know, university on the politics of Southeast Asia. So uh, he's predicting no outright war or large scale uh, conflict but uh, simmering tensions uh, that could um, you know, flare up from time to time over the South China Sea disputes. Um, now, um, let me go back to uh, Professor Sriparna Patak, our Northeast Asia expert. And uh, Professor Patak, 
North Korea, uh, the, the whole uh, buildup over North Korea and also Taiwan. Uh, please share your thoughts. I took my camera so that you know, the bandwidth a little better. Um, Professor Vishal beautifully explained and put everything into perspective. Uh, before I just explain about, you know, Taiwan and North Korea, there were two things which I wanted to talk about. Uh, is a new threat to the international uh, security apparatus, but is not spoken of very often. Um, to begin with, uh, there was this report in 2022, and it talked about how an artificial intelligence company with links to China's security apparatus, has been collecting voice data to enable mass surveillance in India. Um, so this is by New Kite Data Labs, and it stated that Speech Ocean, which is a Beijing-based company with links to the People's Liberation Army, has been collecting voice samples from militarily sensitive regions of India, including Jammu and Kashmir and Punjab. So, um, you know, AI, the way AI can be used is multifaceted, but we don't recognize it. Um, there are not too many discussions at the state to state level. You know, largely a new. We, I'm sorry, we are having continue to have severe uh, audio disruptions while you're speaking. So I'll try and get, come back to you because, in the interest of the audience, uh, yeah. there's a clarity problem. Um, moving on, I'll come back to East Asia when we can, um, uh, audience. Let me go to um, South Asia, which is, of course, where India is located. India is the major power here. And we have two South Asian specialists uh, among our colleagues who are joining, uh, Professor Jyoti Pathania and Professor Sriradha Datta. Let me start with Professor Jyoti Pathania, uh, who has recently authored an important book about the deep state in Pakistan and, the, and has been following the um, terrorism threat in the region. And this is, of course, magnified many fold you may have all followed the uh, devastating attacks in Peshawar uh, recently and across Pakistan and the Durand line inside Afghanistan. So uh, Professor Patania, um, this region of course has always been volatile, but now it looks like just when the war in Afghanistan ended, it looks like the war has just been extended has become more uh, widespread in all uh, forms across the region. And there's a real threat of this uh, jihadist menace, not only consuming Pakistan, but also sweeping across the whole region. Uh, so your thoughts on the threats to peace and security emanating from this region, from the AFPAC region, please, Professor Badani. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Shriram. Um, you know, as you rightly said, South Asia has always been a volatile region. And I would try and extend what you talked about terrorism to uh, increasing economies of terrorism that is, that is happening in South Asia. And you know, the implications of this, especially of terrorism, is happening not only to India, but also to the rest of South Asian countries. So what are these implications? A, implications are at the geostrategic level. B, the implications are at geopolitical level. C, even geoeconomics. You know, there is a, India and Pakistan can trade up to $37 billion. And look at the trade now, it's merely two today. So we are not utilizing our geographical, God-gifted geographical proximity, proximity to trade. There is, has been an increase in military budget in almost all South Asian countries. Why? Social media today is being used as an instrument of terrorism, if I may put it. You see any social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, there are inklings of terrorist rooting in these social media as well. There is a spate of hyper-nationalism, which is again, something which we are which we are witnessing not only all over the world but also in south asia but to come back to the point of terrorism in south asia as long as terrorism proxy wars and insurgency remain embedded in the mindsets of i would say um, the pakistani uh, military or the deep state the deep state continuum will have its ramifications on the rest of South Asia. They have created a monster and that Hydra headed monster in the form of Tariq-e-Taliban Pakistan is 
engulfing their own creators. I think I'll stop at that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Patania. Yes, indeed, uh, things have gotten completely out of control um, as far as the proxy war goes. And now it's coming back to bite the hand that fed it initially. Uh, viewers, if you are from many other parts of the world, you know, uh, people often look at the uh, problems in the region in terms of India-Pakistan conflict over Kashmir. But now it's become much bigger. In fact, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Shahbaz Sharif, after the devastating uh, terror attack on the police headquarters in Peshawar, he said that the number one threat Pakistan faces today is terrorism. It's not India. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, yes. things have changed, but one would hope that the entire system wakes up to the reality that, uh, you know, they are committing suicide out there, a large scale collective suicide, and it's getting worse. Uh, and on the Afghan side, also, there's a severe humanitarian crisis and complete breakdown of law and order under the Taliban rule. Uh, with daily attacks by ISIS and other uh, terror groups. So um, let me on that point bring in also my colleague, Professor Pankaj Jha. Uh, he's a specialist on uh, security issues uh, and he heads our Center for Security Studies. And I'd like to bring him in on this terror question. You know, often, uh, Professor Jha, now we are saying that big geopolitics has come back and it's now back to nation state versus nation state rivalry, which uh, had seem to be vanishing after the Cold War ended. Now we are saying that these, you know, great power rivalries and regional power rivalries are the main drivers of instability. But then there is also the so-called non-state actors and we can't completely discount them. And the ISIS, Islamic State, and then the Al-Qaeda and other uh, affiliated groups continue to regroup uh, across West Asia. You are seeing that in um, Iraq and uh, Syria, uh, even the earthquake affected areas, most of these are jihadist groups which control those places like Idlib province. So, um, and then we are seeing it here in South Asia and then also in Southeast Asia, there is a strong resurgence of ISIS. So Professor Jha, these groups, obviously ISIS is not a state controlled entity. It's a genuine transnational uh, terrorist group that cannot, cannot be called the puppet of any government. So these kind of actors, uh, what is the prognosis? How do you see them? Uh, gaining in light of the general instability and the rising uh, geopolitical tensions? Can they capitalize on the economic collapse and failing states um, across the developing world and become bigger and bigger? How do you see the ISIS and Al-Qaeda going forward? Thank you for the question, Professor Chaudhya. When you look into these aspects which are really germinating from different spheres, we have always found that natural disasters or catastrophes are one of the best aspects where the people become vulnerable and these groups again you know fish in troubled waters we have seen many of these new cadres new people who feel that they were less uh, religious and therefore they have to suffer these kind of causes and we have seen these groups also uh, getting all kinds of funding and support to at least regroup and regenerate themselves uh, more importantly we have seen when isis was failing and there was such a defeat in certain counters where you find these lone wolf scenarios which were emerging. There were self-radicalized youth which were doing all kinds of things. Now, this type of things which are really coming up, I believe somewhere down the line, two things will be very critical. First, how much is the subscription for the regeneration of groups like Al-Qaeda and Islamic State? And second, how much the other terror groups, which are religious terror groups or other kinds of groups, how do they feel that who is their global leader in terms of representing their uh, ideology, representing their larger agendas. So in that case, I believe uh, Al-Qaeda might be coming back again, given the fact that many of the African groups now feel that the Al-Qaeda is one of the things which is going to emerge again. And Islamic State, it depends on, again, how much finances and support they have in few of the corners of West Asia. More importantly, if you look across the world, I think there are new kinds of terror which will be taking shape, which includes weaponization of viruses, your use of more uh, bio agents to really create havoc because they have testified and they know that this is much more easier to do and will have cascading effects on a larger population. And, and this is where the terrorism, the fifth phase of terrorism, which Rova put that, that caused it, the fourth phase was more religious and uh, ethno-nationalist. The fifth phase will be much more 
uh, difficult to decipher and we need to look into how it will shape up because the counterterrorism agencies will have a really hard time countering these new forms of terrorism which are going to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jha. Uh, in fact, he teaches uh, courses in the online MAIRSS on um, intelligence and terrorism and related uh, topics. So he is a wealth of now. He's worked in India's National Security Council and uh, has vast experience of security issues. Um, let me also bring in my colleague, Professor Sriradha Datta. Uh, Professor Datta, the thing is, there's a lot of fragility we are seeing. Uh, if you look at the Indian Ocean region, if you look at uh, the broader uh, global south, a lot of countries have caved in under the financial pressure uh, caused by the shutdowns of the pandemic and then the ripple effects of the Russia-Ukraine war. So uh, if you look at the region, you look at South Asia, there are a lot of countries that look very fragile. We've seen the collapse in Sri Lanka once already. And uh, there are many others that seem to be barely afloat. Uh, even countries that were considered relatively fiscally stable before are now tottering. So um, do you think this could uh, escalate into uh, other forms of like violent uh, uh, emanations coming out of these economic, uh, you know, failures and uh, state failure and these kind of or fragi fragility and which are the which which countries should we watch out for? Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. Yes, absolutely. I think um, what we saw, see in the external, uh, you know, outer South Asia, the whole outbreak of COVID uh, and of course the Re Russian and the Ukraine conflict, uh, which has contributed to the global inflation and, you know, there's a very severe fuel and food crisis everywhere, which has also exasperated the economic and the political challenges which South Asia always has been dealing with. It's not new, but this has added a certain amount of weightage which has not been, you know, anticipated. And right now, I think you mentioned Sri Lanka, there is Bangladesh, there is Nepal, they're all facing very severe fiscal deficits, their the export revenues have uh, diluted, their external debts have risen, uh, very poor low foreign reserves just now, and of course, alongside the economic and the fiscal problems, uh, each of them have facing, uh, you know, poor governance and corruption. Uh, Sri Lanka, of course, is a case in point that you mentioned. They've been able to kind of get the, uh, you know, the local population kind of address some of the challenges right now. But it's a it's a struggle there because in a recent visit to Colombo, uh, we thought that uh, there was always that simmering effect. It's not as if it's been brought under control. Uh, similarly for Bangladesh, it's heading for elections in less than a year's time. Uh, corruption again has you know, hit the ceiling there. Uh, they've again also had to reach out to IMF for uh, support, as they call it. Uh, but also, this is not only the fact that of, because of the COVID crisis and U uh, Ukraine conflict, but also because this was a reflection of the deep uh, lack of, you know, the deep corruption that the country is facing. We've heard about how banks have collapsed and how family-owned uh, agencies have been controlling the, you know, the fiscal issues. Nepal again is. Uh, you know, we just had elections in Nepal. We still see a government which looks very unstable at this point of time. Uh, again, both Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bangladesh, we've seen from time to time people come out in the, you know, open and on the streets. And I think for the time being, they've managed, but it's not something that they'll be able to ward off until unless there's some very, you know, severe reforms and strict uh, reform packages being, uh, you know, forwarded. Of course, I think the point here, I would like to say that I, you know, there's been a mention of China here, and I think in South Asia also, uh, China has been a very prominent player. But in this crisis, I it's very clear that, you know, Sri Lanka saying it openly now that how they've been uh, let down by China. Uh, we've seen Maldives change track also and moved you know, in terms of uh, asking India for a lot of uh, infrastructure development and support, which wasn't the case earlier, India has been able to deliver. I think right now, India in this, at this scenario is looking as a very stable car. They're, of course, the first responders. As we are aware, uh, 
we've also seen that how in terms of lines of credit india has given the largest to bangladesh but in this particular economic crisis we saw india uh, you know unhesitantly give that 3.8 billion and of course a lot of infrastructure projects are going on including with nepal we we also we know we are aware of the fact that all these states at some point of time have some kind of tension with india despite the fact that there is no open hostility really but uh, it's it's something it's a it it the i wouldn't say it's still very stable i think there are you know crisis points just as like in pakistan and afghanistan it wouldn't be so uh, terror driven but at the same time economic and you know social uh, misgivings continue to uh, be the some of the you know points that we need to watch out for in south asia it's a di- it's difficult times ahead i mean while i would say that again india has been uh, of consolidating power here every region right now every nation uh, in south asia is looking up to india and india support and i think india right now has been able to you know uh, been deliver on its promises uh, but it's still a struggle and i think there are uh, we need to be very cautious about the days ahead thank you thank you professor datta yes difficult times ahead and you know there's only so much that external uh, you know rescue can do in these kind of situation where the fiscal mismanagement and the corruption and the it's been hollowed out from inside and uh, i saw that a number of uh, friends from west african region are also in the audience uh, from niger from cote d'ivoire um, uh, from mali and other places and uh you know what we are talking about in fact uh, there is this uh, large scale uh, uh you know re- resurgence of uh, so called al qaeda or isis or affiliated groups there many of which are linked to uh, uh weak states and uh, you know lack of uh, governance reforms and in some cases even dictatorial regimes we are seeing also a tussle between france and russia for control in this region uh, with uh, many of these former francophone countries rejecting uh, France's role and uh, instead inviting the Russians in it's very interesting developments going on there but the fragility is the point we are making south asia and africa the region we are in and also um, uh, 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 the african continent is where of course the maximum um, uh, rates of poverty remain and therefore uh, these are regions that are explosive inherently structurally due to these problems so we when we talk of threats to peace and security is not only you know large scale warfare or aggression or attacks by big powers against our our, our proxy wars it's also these kind of festering problems that can become big and then can um, magnify beyond control um, so we'll talk about a few of these issues also uh, somalia ethiopia and uh, the famine in east africa uh, which is the most severe one since 1980s so we are we are looking at you know large scale uh, tensions arising as a result of these underlying structural problems um i'll try and get my colleague uh, professor sriparna padak back one more time uh, to talk about the missing links in asia which is the north korea and taiwan and these two flash points and uh, we'll see if we can get through with her this time uh, professor bada thank you professor chalya um, i'm really sorry the internet connection is not stable i'm still not sure if you can hear me clearly but um, you know with regards to taiwan um, taiwan is an industrialized country one of the reasons why china would want to retain control over taiwan is because of the entire chip making industry the united states of america also would not want to overlook this entire um capacity which the taiwanese have um so taiwan is definitely a flash point will china attack it at any point soon there is no guarantee as to when china is actually going to attack it china is also watching how the russia ukraine crisis is unfolding um taiwan remains a very hot a very big flash point in east asia north korea again remains a big flash point and there is still a china angle over there because um you know it's believed that it's only china which can actually control north korea but in very clandestine ways china has supplied north korea with nuclear arsenals with nuclear know how otherwise it won't be the sort of problem that it is today one quick point and i would like to you know just uh, pass on the dais back to professor cholia after this since we are talking about um international security and uh, threats to international security one point again which we have 
most often we we most commonly forget about is the usage of artificial intelligence um, before i you know before my internet started misbehaving i was talking about how china collects data from um, militarily sensitive regions in india it happens even from other militarily sensitive regions but we rarely talk about how artificial intelligence can be used one more recent us based uh, report which has come out um, from this firm called graphica it talks about political spam which promotes new and distinctive forms of video content and this has been called spamouflage which is a spin on the term camouflage and um, the element hidden in spamouflage um, you know basically what it does is cryptic coloration um it spreads disinformation misinformation um it's it's state aligned operations against um, you know particular states and uh, state affiliated actors so this is another domain which we rarely talk about china has made great strides in ai but it's time that you know um other countries start focusing on how it can be misused and this is an arena in which uh, which is a huge um, problem as far as international security goes so thank you so much again professor cholia for being thank so patient you. with me thank you so much yeah well the chinese surveillance has now uh, come up to center stage and something that many countries are worried about and we'll have to see whether more such so called uh, spy balloon type incidents can metamorphose into something bigger uh, now uh, last but not least uh, ambassador ravi thapar uh, executive dean of the school of international affairs at uh, jindal university i'd like him to come in he's a specialist on global south and on uh, developing countries and he's a great believer in south south cooperation he teaches courses on these issues uh, ambassador thapar you've heard the whole discussion we've uh, you know discussed a wide variety of threats to international peace and security but it's quite obvious that the bulk of the suffering that we are see we are seeing and we are going to see as these things break down as the systems break down and the institutions fail is going to fall on developing countries and today uh, you know i'm just looking at the nationalities of those who are in the audience the vast majority of them are from um, from from <clears throat> the middle east slash west asia from south asia from um, africa and a few from latin america so um, going forward these uh, these countries you know the global south is facing uh, enormous uh, challenges so how do you think they can cope with these threats i mean one is the the old recipes of unification and of regional you know unification like we have the african union and the african union if there is a war in ethiopia uh, uh, uh with the tigray region then the african union steps in and uh, tries to negotiate and bring it to a halt if there is you know conflict in um, um in the sahel region again uh, the ecowas should do it if there is a problem with venezuela then uh, the regional um uh, institution celac or one of the other ones in the oas should do it so that has been the formula right but right now we are not seeing these regional institutions being that effective so um what do you think lies in store in terms of uh, peace and security for the global south as a whole your thoughts sir uh professor chaulia i may be forgiven uh, to also bring in some security aspects because i happen to be the last speaker and i did handle the foreign ministry's security dialogue counter terrorism dialogue for 3 years uh let me just say or attempt to diagnose a lot of the problems today i think has subterranean fault lines we have actually laid down after the world war 2 and the un system a framework which we thought would address global peace the welfare of mankind etc but the fact is that during the last 75 years this has not worked the way it should have in fact the global south's uh, standing criticism is that despite all the promises which have been made the most recent being millennium development goals and then the sustainable development goals which are a great vision uh i'd also exemplify to you the climate change promises of the unfccc talks in paris where 100 billion dollars was promised for uh green technology adaptation to the global south countries so that global warming could be curtailed none of this has actually played out the way it should be let me point out or remind the audience here that none other than in his former incarnation and now presently again president lula after the ipsa meeting in delhi in october 2008 made a you know 
remark in lighthearted banter, but very seriously taken by everybody that the developed countries are actually turning this world into a global casino. And they are playing with the lives of people because there is a very, very ill-defined global monetary and financial architecture. We find that the G7, uh, the G8, of course, after Crimea war became G7, and the G7 is increasingly not as important or listened to as the G20. And the G20's origins actually start off from the global monetary and financial architecture. So what I'm trying to say is that basically what we created after the World War II and the UN system is a very inequitable world. There are extreme pockets of poverty, malnutrition all over. Global economic divide, which I have taught for, uh, you know, in the last semester or two, Professor Jason Heichel in The Divide very clearly identifies the problem. You know, 10% of the top population of the world is walking away with 52% of the global GDP, you know, the global income, and 76% of the global wealth. I mean, the bottom most 50% are left with only 2% or 8%. 2% of the global wealth and 8% of the wealth. A billionaire was born during COVID every 76 hours. That's the kind of inequality. And 160 million people were pushed into poverty during COVID. Elon Musk had resources to buy out Twitter for about 44, 45 you know, billion dollars. And Ceylon, uh, Sri Lanka's total G uh, global debt, total debt was about 43, 44 billion. And people were joking around that if he buys Ceylon's debt, he'll become Ceylon Musk. And that's the kind of, you know, power which multinationals and big guys have. So obviously, there are going to be millions of people and communities in the world which are not going to be satisfied. Now, add to this the other situation. We created a UN Security Council. So, so let me just come back to terrorism. So what I used to diagnose as the additional secretary counterterrorism, and a lot of us had exchanges on this. We have created this huge unequal world where millions of the youth, Middle East, Africa, et cetera, you know, just are looking at a very dark tunnel. They don't know where it's going to lead to. Obviously, they are very vulnerable to ideology. Someone comes along and tries to misguide them or misinterpret, you know, uh, religious tenets and tries to tell them this is all that the West taught you. This is all fake. This is not going to deliver you the panacea it promises. This is not the way forward. And then there's also a bit of a cultural annoyance. They feel that, you know, the West is being culturally arrogant and maybe that their way of life is being questioned and their practices which are classical or traditional are being held in contempt. So all this has played and got into, you know, these terrorist ideology, which has just proliferated and youngsters are being pulled into, uh, whether it's the Boko Haram, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's Afghanistan, of course, they do have a religious element to it, it has a religious element, it has an economic element because you created a very unequal world. You created a very unfair world. And the leader says, well, you see how it's playing. No one is able to give you the livelihood or you know, the occupations and the prosperity it was prom they, they promised you. So this becomes, they become very, very you know, vulnerable and ideal recruiting ground for getting into terrorism. So this is what has been happening. The same thing I would submit translates into what is happening in the geopolitical environment today. Leaders are merely a reflection of what their people want to be. Let's just understand this is a slightly different era from what it was even 30 years ago. This is a social media era. This is an era where there is a digital and a virtual world in 24-7 session. There is a parallel world out there which is looking at all kinds of issues. Now, in that environment, you know, if the people, the ordinary man feels very strongly about certain things, especially that he is being wrong, that the world architecture, economic architecture, frankly, is not doing what it's supposed to. He's going to get very, very upset. So there are very large communities in the global south, in, in various parts of the world, which are dissatisfied. And obviously, the causes are that they are not getting access to those facilities, 
those creature comforts, those standard of living, which counterparts in the West and other economies are having. So the leaders also are going to reflect. Now, the US model was one you know, pillar in the global architecture has been, and the Europeans also, their allies have been part, uh, partners in that. But unfortunately, what has happened is that that model has not worked. So the people in these Af African countries, other countries in the global South are questioning that model. And the Chinese, which promise a different model, and maybe the Russians too, they are coming out with a new model. They say this old model, which is led by the North countries of US, Europeans are, is not working out. So we will give you perhaps a changed scenario where things are more equitable. Well, there are people who are getting recruited in that. And of course, the other issue is that when you want to maintain a monopoly of the five major powers, this is another fault which the North did not understand. When they laid down the UN Charter, started the UN Charter, we have been clamoring for ages. You know, the G4, other countries, of course, not entirely in sync with us. We've been telling them that reformat the UN Security Council architecture. You've just got five countries calling the shots. Well, one of them decided to yeah, sorry. Yes, uh, yes. thank you. Thank Too you. Thank long. you, Professor Tapa, for paucity of time. I'll have to hold you, but, uh, you know, uh, he's so, a fascinating person to learn from. Yeah, yeah so, so the please, Global please. South, basically, I'll just finish off. So these are, the, uh, these are the fault lines in the international environment. So what the Global South has to do, I think it has to wake up, it has to resonate, and it has to show more unity. Uh, it should not be partisan and get into temporary, you know, alliances or friendships between global powers. It should be together. The Buenos Aires plan of action, I think BAPA, which took place uh, 40 years ago and then again uh, recently in 2016, it talks of using technology. It used, talks of using, you know, uh, resonance and unity on various issues, coming together at the UN, coming together to fight out and get a better cake, better share, uh, better share in the global economy. I think that is the only way forward because otherwise, uh, and, 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 and my last point, uh, I know there's paucity of time. The solution for the present problems, I think is also going to be economics. Uh, China is still holding on because China is deeply, deeply involved in the economies of all the world. It's goods and services are being sold, sold all over. It does not want to be seen as having violated those principles because otherwise it will be boycotted. So that's the reason why it has been, you know, carefully calibrating its responses. So the solution, I think, ultimately, based on interdependence of economies, based on the interconnectivity which economies have, we should find economic solutions Thank get together Thank as a global. Thank you, Ambassador Thapa. He uh, was India's ambassador to Panama and uh, he's got a focus on economic issues and in fact uh, students uh, who are in the audience you know what is quite clear from this discussion is that security threats um, and threats to peace and security are not solely in the domain of uh, military or uh, political problems these are these are secure they're, they're not just confined to competition between countries they have to do uh, a lot with the economic uh, you know, pillars on the basis of which the current order has been built or which is on the basis of which the current order is unraveling. And the inequalities that Ambassador Thapa pointed out are worth focusing on because uh, they could become explosive as we talk. As he said, you know, anyone who's frustrated and who's feeling powerless now has uh, so much over the internet to be able to go out and cause mayhem. Uh, we are seeing a lot of that around the world and uh, lone wolf attacks and organized attacks and of course large scale uprisings insurgencies and um, uh, terrorist movements so we are actually at a breaking point in many ways it's not good news but it's good news for you enthusiasts of international security because we have created this master's degree program especially for those of you who are worried and who are concerned about the state of the world especially for those of you all who believe that you know things are going downhill and we need to acquire knowledge and understanding about problems first and only then talk about action and what all we can do to uh, prevent this free fall or to just set a floor under this uh, declining international system. 
otherwise um, without knowledge with half baked knowledge uh, or with just uh, informing yourself based on reading world news it's not sufficient so that's why we've created this master's program i invite you all to apply to it we are continuing uh, admissions into the ma international relations security and strategy program on coursera and the links have just been shared on the chat uh, by uh, my colleagues and i'll ask uh, my colleague professor devika mishra to close this event she is the uh, um, person administering the entire online MA IRSS degree, uh, and uh, she's also a Latin America specialist. We didn't have time for her to speak about Latin America, but maybe you want to come in on that, uh, uh, Professor Mishra, and then also talk a bit about the admissions before we close. Thank you, Professor Jolia. Um, I'll uh, I'll not uh, take too much time for. Um, I know that we have overshot the time limit. And there are some 150 students here who have logged in from all over the world. I firstly really want to talk about the degree, as you can see on the screen. Um, this is offered with Coursera, our platform partners, and it's a premier one-of-a-kind degree that combines IR with a very specific intelligence, security, and strategy focus. As you would have seen from the panel that has been assembled for this talk, um, we have a bunch of academic practitioners like Professor Mohan Kumar, Professor Thapar, Professor Mishra, along with career academicians like Professor Chaulia, Professor Patak, Professor Datta, and of course, Professor Pankaja and Professor Patania. Many of them teach courses which you will not find in any other online degree. There is an active MOOC that has been designed and curated by Professor Chaulia called Power and Foreign Policy and International Relations that you can go and take a look at. Admissions are open. Uh, and uh, very quickly to wrap up about security threats in Latin America, I think it's fascinating to see the level of political instability that has been unleashed post the pandemic, whether you talk about a climate instability, whether you talk about political instability in terms of fracturing of political parties, whether you talk about social movements fracturing. I mean, it almost seems that you know protests can't seem to really make up their mind as to the direction that they really want to take uh, the conversation forward in. And I wish we had more time to talk about this because I saw that there were several students who had joined us from Latin America. But um, again, like Leela has been mentioning, please write to us at online at jgu.edu.in and apply for the MA online uh, degree. And uh, admissions opens till 28th February. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Professor Chaulia, over to you to close us. Thank you, uh, Professor Mishra. Yes. Well, we didn't have time to discuss the crisis in Peru and the you know simmering uh, problems in, in Brazil, the polarization and uh, many other uh, topics from the Caribbean also where you know Haiti is remains a sore spot with a severe governance breakdown where gangs are controlling the country. So you know it's it's it's, it's our collective endeavor in this master's degree program to get you to think about all these uh, major problems, to, to get you to think about how countries formulate their strategies uh, in this deteriorating environment. And of course, uh, hope that uh, countries come together uh, and also solve global governance problems. But uh, for all that to happen, the first step is knowledge, systematic understanding. And that's what we are doing through our MA IRSS degree program. So I invite you all to apply um, to it uh, as soon as you can. It's on Coursera. The links have been shared, and please, uh, we look forward to your applications, and we so that we can continue these discussions, very very stimulating discussions about the state of the world and the uh, future of global order and such big questions uh, in the classroom with all of us. So we look forward to your applications and uh, keep an eye out for the MAIRSS uh, on Coursera. Thank you so much. Thank you to colleagues. Thank you audience. And uh, I'm sorry we couldn't answer. A lot of your questions, but uh, we'll try and get back to you uh, in due course. Uh, we have noted them down. So all the very best to all of you. And uh, no matter what your previous uh, bachelor's degree or even your master's degree is in, you could uh, even apply for a second master's or your first master. If this is going to be your first master, it's going to be, I can say, uh, an outstanding one, which will equip you to deal with uh, issues facing your country and your region, and also get you uh, promoted in your organizations if you're already working. So we have a whole range of students 
enrolled in this program over the last two years. You know, I think more than 50 nationality, 50 countries, we have students enrolled in this program and we expect many more. So everybody is welcome and uh, do check out the MAIRSS. Thank you so much and uh, God bless you all. Take care. Thank you.